If you have your Bibles, I'd like to read from John chapter 17. When I told Christine what my uh, scripture passage was today, she said, well, you're not going to preach from that whole chapter, are you? And the truth is, I will not be able to bring out uh, in depth all of this prayer. But it seems to me like this should be called the Lord's Prayer right here. The other prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer is really Jesus teaching us how to pray. But this is actually Jesus praying himself. It is the longest recorded prayer in the Bible, certainly the longest that, that Jesus made, that we have recorded. So in chapter 17, uh, if you have the Pew Bibles, it is page 1070 in the Pew Bibles. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought glory I have brought glory, you, you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have, have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And the glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except for one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the, word ha the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you might protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, for I sanctify myself that they too might be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me. I have given them glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you love me 
before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, <coughs> though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Sometimes when I kind of put myself in the place of the disciples, I can get the sense that Jesus is praying for me personally, just as he was praying for the disciples. There is no voice which has ever been heard, either in heaven or in earth, more exalted, more holy, and more fruitful, more sublime than the prayer offered by the Son to God himself. And this is really a prayer to be uh, studied. I believe we can learn also from this prayer as much as we do from the Lord's Prayer, which we often recite. I would challenge you to memorize this prayer. That would take some work, wouldn't it? Actually memorize this one. This is the only continuous prayer of Jesus recorded in the Bible. Romans 8, 34 says, Jesus is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. So Jesus has ascended to heaven and is at the right hand of God and he is praying for us right now in an intercessory type of prayer. There is much we can learn about prayer from this general example. You know, there are many prayers listed in the Bible. There are prayers of the prophets in the Old Testament. There are prayers of the disciples. There are many prayers that Paul made in the epistles. And it's good for us when we're reading scripture and we come upon a certain prayer right there to pause and Take a look at that prayer. Many times we can make their prayer our prayer. We can put the text and the general thought of their own prayer into our life. Now the Bible says here in verse 1 that Jesus looked up toward heaven and prayed. Now that doesn't imply that we all must look up to heaven and pray. It just mentions that that was Jesus' posture in this particular time. He prayed a prayer of faith and confidence. There is no mention of his struggles or problems or even decisions that he would be making. And remember, this prayer is the day before he is crucified, this very night. He would be arrested in the garden and the whole night he would go through a mock trial and be crucified today. Jesus prayed in relationship to the, to the Father as we can see in the words. He uses the word Father and your Son as he refers to himself. And Jesus prayed to the Father and we are the sons and daughters of God. We can pray to the Father, much like a relationship with our own Father. We have been adopted into the family of God. And first of all, we see in the first uh, five verses here that Jesus is praying for himself. And he prays mainly that he might glorify the Father in his life. The cross really is glorification, even though we hardly look at it that way. It's hard for us to see glory in the cross of Jesus Christ, the execution, the crucifixion, and what seems to be the 
just a total tragedy. The cross, when looked at from our worldly values, seems to be a complete defeat of Christ. And I believe for a little while, the disciples looked at it that way pretty much as he was being taken unjustly and crucified. And you know, in my life, there is a lot that seems senseless. And I have to believe that God is glorified somehow, even in the senseless things that take place in my life. I had a pretty severe accident a few years ago. And for the longest while, I could not recognize anything that would glorify God in that accident. And in today, today's prayer, we have prayed for at least two people that have had pretty serious accidents. Now, we were thankful for Keith, who his accident, he has recovered some. We're thankful for that. But these accidents are horrible surprises in our life, and I have to ask God through in them, how did this bring honor and glory to you? And it caused so much suffering in my own life. And so much of what happens sometimes in our life is difficult to connect to God being glorified in this. 1 Corinthians 1.18 sheds a little light. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. I can almost see that exactly in the world. We talk to non-believers about the cross of Jesus Christ and him being crucified in payment for our sins. The world doesn't get it for the most part. And they, they have to pause and try to understand this great truth. But then this verse goes on to say, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That same cross, which is foolishness to the world, unto us has a completely different focus. Because we know that it is the love of Christ that took him and held him on that cross. We are actually glorifying the cross as the payment for our sins. And so Jesus' prayer is a contrast even to many of the prayers that we make. I want in my heart to make prayer that I might glorify God. No matter what my experience is, no matter what happens in my life, but then when I look at my prayers, and I might not say some of these uh, sentences verbatim exactly like this in my prayers, but I wonder if the underlying goal of my prayer isn't more selfish than it is glorifying God. So I might pray this. Give me the largest congregation in Grant County. Now, I never say that in a prayer. <clears throat> but I often pray that the church might grow. It's underneath that prayer. Oh, Lord, make this the largest congregation in Grant County. And then I might pray, give me spiritual power. Now, I might not say that specific thing in a prayer. But I just begin to think about my prayers and to think, Randy, do you want yourself set up as some person with spiritual power? Well, in some sense, maybe, but not in a selfish way, I hope. 
And then maybe I would pray, help me to be sought after as a spiritual leader. Whoa, help me to be a spiritual leader. Make me like Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> would I make a prayer like that? Probably not. But yet I have to ask myself, what is the underlying motive of the prayers I do pray? Could I really say that my own prayers is to glorify God? This might be essentially what I'm asking, even though I don't say these very words. And so I was thinking about this and was asking God, direct my prayers to bring glory to you and not myself. Well, I think Jesus gives us a perfect example of how to do this in this very passage, these first five verses. And he just continually focuses on glorifying his Father, the Father God. May the glory of God be our overall prayers. And so I wanted the Lord to expose my selfish prayers and help me to refocus on the glory of God. And sometimes, you know, some of the struggles that I have might actually bring glory to God. Well, just mentioning my accident a few years ago, now with a better perspective, <clears throat> I can actually see a lot of miracles that took place. And in many ways, God is glorified because he did the work in a miraculous way, actually. And I don't want to, in a prayer, draw attention to myself, but I want to say, may God be glorified in this. God has the eternal authority of eternal life. Verse 2, you have given him, Jesus, authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him Jesus this is the Godhead in coordination of giving eternal life and then I noticed where he says I have finished the work and it seems like the work that Jesus came to do was really calling the disciples. It was really raising up the disciples that they might go forth with the gospel message after Jesus ascended to heaven. The entire church and the gospel message came through those disciples. It's very likely also that Paul and his teaching and the way he set forth in his missionary journeys, it's very likely that we today can credit Paul with the spreading of the gospel toward our part of the world. Jesus then prays for the disciples. He has taught them to have faith in God, and now he prays for them. And you know, I want to um, bring up the value of praying for a person in their presence. There is great value of actually praying for a person in their presence. And let me give you a place where I believe that should happen. In the family. When your children hear you praying for them, <laughs> in their presence, by their name, it makes a great impression on them. And they can see their parents asking the Lord for protection and guidance on their own children. So Jesus prayed in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, you are our epistle written in our hearts known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, 
written not with ink, but the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. You see, where the real benefit would be that they would have the gospel and the message of God in their hearts. Paul would even say, not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God. He prayed that they would be protected against evil. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse uh, 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. In Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what that is good and perfect will of God. Now, I hope that in reviewing this, what I still like to call the Lord's Prayer, John 17, I hope that I have just raised enough of your curiosity that you might reread this chapter again when you have the time to actually explore uh, each part of Jesus' prayer for us. And you know what the beautiful thing about all this is in this prayer? He is still praying for us today. Amen. Amen. He's still praying. You and I can know that Jesus, our Savior, is praying for us at the right hand of the Father. Well, I appreciate that so much, so very much, because I'm ready to say, Lord, I need those prayers. I need those prayers to take me through the struggles that I'm having. <clears throat> Well, the old car is back in the shop again. And the best thing about having older vehicles is you want to have three or four. So at least one of them's running most of the time. All right. I want to close by raising this insert that is in your bulletin today. This is a time for fasting and prayer, and I mostly want to emphasize the six areas of praying that is on the right side, exalting and thanking God for his great love and care for us. Number one, for Christ church and for those attendees that need to sincerely invite Jesus to be Savior and Lord of their life. You know, I've heard some estimates in statistics that a large percentage of people who attend church still do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We don't want that. We want everyone that attends church to know Christ as Savior. And then let's pray for Israel and those impacted by war in the Middle East and Ukraine. Those are just a small sampling of the wars and conflicts that are around the world. And another focus is our youth in America that need to be back in church. At a recent regional meeting of the Central Allegheny region, we discussed that there's not very many youth attending any of our churches in the entire region. And we're concerned about that. We have youth somewhere, but they're not in church as much as they should be. We want to pray for our country and elected leaderships that seem to be so divided. And also pray for pastors and leaders and churches in this country and around the world. Now, this should keep us busy 
because any one of these praying uh, points, you might say, are very vital to us in the church. So today, if you can, and it's appropriate for you to do, don't do anything that's um, going to affect your health at all, but if it's appropriate and you can participate in fasting today and also praying over these very issues here, I would invite you to do that today. So let us pray now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this prayer recorded here in John. I thank you for Jesus just illustrating his heart in prayer like this. The way he prayed for the disciples, I can almost believe that he is praying for us in the same way. So we might be able to read this prayer just like it was Jesus praying for us. And that uh, blesses my heart to think about that. We have a Savior that's not disconnected from us, but is involved and is praying for us even now. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.